But then there's another step to spiritual growth, which isn't actually about us being fed by someone else or feeding ourselves. It's actually we begin to transition to feeding others. It's like going on a missions trip and you think I'm going to help them. But while you're there, you end up being changed in the process because you are endeavoring to feed someone else. This is The Calling with Steve Smith, a Family Life original podcast that talks with pastors about the professional and personal challenges they face in their mission to lead others to Christ. Our guest for episode one is Pastor Brad Jenkins from Anthem Church near Tulsa, Oklahoma. Brad, welcome to Family Life. Welcome to the first episode of The Calling. And Interesting that it's called The Calling, because in a recent message that you had that I watched online, you mentioned that term, The Calling, and, and I'm guilty of thinking, mm-hmm. okay, it's just pastors and, and uh, just missionaries that are, uh, have a calling to go, but you mm-hmm. pointed out something else. Why don't you talk about what you pointed out about how all of us are called? Well, Steve, great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me, and um, yeah, calling such an important word for us as Christians, first of all, the idea of calling is that there's somebody on the other end who's calling out to us. So when we think about who God is, God, we believe God to be a speaking God who loves humanity. He's been reaching out to humanity all the way back. The Garden of Eden, when you see Adam and Eve hiding, you see God calling out to them. So calling the idea of God calling out to humans to draw them into relationship with himself has always been a critical part of who God is by his very nature. So but when we get down to the specifics of the idea of calling, I think you have to go back to the basics, the idea that God has created every single person for a certain kind of activity in the world to make a certain difference with their life in the world. And so in that sense, we understand that God has a calling on every single person's life. And so it's not, there's a certain kind of calling that might be for pastors or ministers or missionaries, and that is a calling, but there's also calling on every man, every woman's life when they come into a relationship with God. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 um, gives us this idea that we were all created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's calling language that God would create works in advance for every single person to do. And so uh, in that sense, we were all created to do something that God designed us for, which means that there is a calling on every single person's life that's specific to their life. And, And so our goal is not to create our calling, but to discover the calling that God has put on our life. And then that unlocks our purpose and our destiny and what God has called us to. I think it's such an incredibly important part of our life in Christ is to to lean into our calling, to receive our calling, and to discover it, and then to live it out the best that we can possibly understand. Versus having to wake up on Monday morning and go, ugh, I got to go get yeah. a paycheck, and I'm not enjoying this, and I can't wait till Friday at five, and that kind of thing. So how mm-hmm. how do you find how do you find your calling? That's probably a multi layered question. I love that you began the idea that the alternative to discovering your calling is to lo- live a very mundane sort of just uh, go through the motions, uh, live for the weekend, and and I think we spend especially related to the idea of work. We're going to connect work with calling because uh, all of our calling doesn't have to do with work, but it is a large percentage. We might think of our calling related to our relationships and our work. Those are the two main uh, areas that we're called to. We're called to certain people. You know, you, you're called to your wife. You're called to your your children, your family. There's a calling there that's unique to you. And then work that's uh, related to you. So when we start talking about our work in terms of identifying our calling, part of what we want to do is pay attention to our story. You know, what has God done in our life leading up? Where where is he? Where have we been? What what kind of things were we drawn to even maybe from a young age or as in our 20s or 30s or 40s as we're discovering, as we're honing, as we're clarifying, we're looking for the areas of our life where we have energy um, versus the areas where we procrastinate. 
So the areas where we procrastinate in our work are probably not the things we're uniquely wired to do. They might be things we have to do, but they're not the things that bring energy to us. And we feel like I could do that for four, six, eight hours and have increasing energy rather than decreasing energy. So paying attention to all of those areas are, as Christians, we might talk about our spiritual gifts to, to pay attention to that or our passions, the work we've done leading up. So all of that stuff begins to paint a picture together to help us get closer to the idea of calling. And if you let me, if I have the time, I, I think it's important to, as we're doing that, as we're discovering those things that we feel like we're uh, most um, created to do versus the things that we see other people created to do. And as we are honest with ourselves and we ask other people also to take a 20,000 foot view out and say, even if I'm lost in the details of my calling at the moment I'm in, there is a certain calling that's related to every Christian. And that is, we have this calling that God has given to us to know Christ. That's the primary calling God has on our life, to know him. He's calling out to us to know him and to bring him glory with our life. So in the in-between of where I am and trying to get to the specifics of my calling, I can go back to my foundational calling, or I might say, my highest calling, which is not related just to the work I have or the job I have or the specifics of that, but I go back to my foundational calling, which is to know God personally and to bring God glory with my life. And so when I'm at a moment of doubt trying to figure out what my specific calling is, I at least know that, and that is a lot, to know that in any job, in any moment, in any season, I can still lean into my highest calling, which is to know Christ and to bring God glory. And then I'm going to pray as I do those things, as I pursue God with my life, as I get to know him, as I'm trying to bring him glory as a parent in my workplace, whether I have a great job or I want to transition to another job, I bring God glory even in that season. And then I say, God, would you reveal to me the unique work you create in advance for me to do in your timing? And, and I just believe if I lean into wanting to bring God glory with my life, that God will continue to get me closer and closer to that unique calling that he's made me for. You know, I don't want to do your message for you or continue it, but it also shows that I was paying attention when you were speaking recently <laughs> on your message that I loved mm -hmm. when you said, when you take these three areas, find out something, because if you're lost right now, if, let's say you're lost in, and yes. you don't like your job, uh, find out what you like, what you're good at, and yes. how you can serve others mm -hmm. through what you're doing. Uh, I love those three things. And when you hit those three things, it's kind of like you're aiming for the bullseye, right? Yes, right. Yeah, I mean, the reality is the specifics are you want to ask those questions. What do you enjoy doing? What are you good at? Where can you make the most significant difference? And the idea of that is as you as you write those ideas down, you got a couple, as you try to answer the question, what do, what do I enjoy doing? What can I make a difference with my life? You end up discovering, we'll say your unique calling from God at the intersection of those ideas. So where can I make a difference with my life? And where do I, and what do I enjoy doing? It ends up, you try to find the place where they begin to overlap. And then you start saying, I think I'm getting close to the bullseye. And that might be seasonal even. God may give you a unique calling for a season that might be even a little different than the next season. There might be similarity, but some unique differences based on the season of life. You're looking at the bullseye of the answer to those three questions. And I think you get really close to where God wants you to be. Are you impressed that I paid attention to your message? I'm incredibly impressed, Steve. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so good. Hey, let me transition to a couple of other things. One, this is an encouragement to other pastors, because when we first reconnected again, uh, Brad was my pastor 11 years ago, uh, or more, 11 and a half years ago in Tulsa. 
But one of the messages that my wife, Audrey, and I remember most, and this is an encouragement to pastors, because sometimes, mm. you know, what's the matter, pastors? You don't, you don't have all of your hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sermons memorized, and you remember every single word of every single one. But Brad, you did a message uh, about the table uh, that mm. Audrey and I still talk about today. And again, it's been uh, nearly a dozen years with this. And I, I'd love you to, to speak to that a little bit. It, it ministered to me and uh, about we need three different areas in our Christian walk. And it dealt with the table. You even brought a table onto the stage to and a chair and, and people mm. up there. So you had the visuals to go along with it. And I'm sure that helped as well. But talk about the table and uh, serving and being served and, and all those mm-hmm. things. Can you pass that along? That was such a fun season in the life of our church and such a powerful series um, to you know, the heart of the idea of the table is you said the, ch- the church is a table where people come to be fed. And so the idea, the picture of the table places us at different seats at the table to get to the idea of spiritual growth. I heard Rick Warren years ago say spiritual growth is God's work, but it requires my participation. So God is the author of the growth he does in my life, but it does require me to lean in and participate and um, allow God to do the work he wants to do in my heart. So the table is the idea of spiritual growth. How do we grow spiritually? Well, we grow spiritually by being fed, we, especially as we first come to Christ or as we're, we go to church on Sundays and we're connected with a body of believers. We, we need people to pour into our life. And so there's a sense in which we sit at the table to be fed by others so that others can pour their life into our lives so that somebody can explain the scriptures to us. And that's part of my role on a Sunday is to, to come prepared to feed others um, the words of life that comes from Jesus's own lips through the scripture. The other piece of spiritual growth is not related to being fed um, by others. You know, uh, when I think of eating on a regular basis, my family, my kids, we love to go out to eat. So when we go out to eat, somebody prepares the meal. They found the ingredients. They know how to cook the food. They know how to get it to the table. We don't really have to do a lot. We enjoy that. We're fed by that. But that's a special occasion. That's basically what it's like for us to go to church on a Sunday or go to a Bible study or go to some some conference or some other environment where somebody's feeding us. Thank God for all those workers and leaders who do that. But that can't be all my uh, intake of food during the week. It can't just be reliant on eating out unless you got, Steve, unless you got some huge budget where you're eating out all the time. You're going to have to cook some meals for yourself. So as we grow in Christ and as we think about our spiritual growth, we know that I can't be reliant on other people to feed me 24-7. At some point as I grow, I learn how to feed myself. And when I say feed myself, I mean I'm opening the scriptures for myself. I'm spending time on maybe finding a read through the Bible in a year plan, or I'm I'm spending time in some, some environment or reading some book that's going to help feed me spiritually so that I can grow. I'm spending time in prayer and, and in the scriptures, and that's feeding me. So those are two pieces of spiritual growth. So in that sense, at the table, sometimes I come to the table and someone feeds me. Other times I come to the table and I prepare the food myself and I feed myself. But then there's another step to spiritual growth, which isn't actually about us being fed by someone else or feeding ourselves. It's actually we begin to transition to feeding others and we begin to serve others. And we're actually preparing to help others grow spiritually by coming to the table. Once again, the church is a table where people come to be fed. And so when I participate and I volunteer and I help and I come alongside other people and I counsel other people, I encourage other people, I lead a Bible study, I I greet people on Sunday morning, whatever role I'm in a kid's classroom, whatever role I play in the body of Christ, part of my spiritual growth isn't going to be related to someone feeding me or me feeding myself. It's actually going to be related to me feeding other people. And God grows me in tremendous, unique ways when I when I stop be thinking about just me being fed and I start thinking about feeding other people. And, and Steve, I'll bet you've seen that in your own life as you, there's moments where you where you turn the tables and you begin to help someone else grow spiritually. And you actually end up growing spiritually as a result of helping them. You think it's really just about them, but actually God does a work in you. It's like going on a missions trip and you think I'm going to help them. And by God's grace, you are going to help them. 
But while you're there, you end up being changed in the process because you are endeavoring to feed someone else and help someone else and go out of your way to serve someone else. And so uh, this is the picture of spiritual growth and what God wants to do in our life as a result of his good plan for how Christians can grow and thrive, being fed, feeding ourselves and feeding other people. Love that message. Love that foundational principle and principles uh, in God's word and how we grow and help each other grow mm-hmm. as uh, Christians. And now I'm going to go, I'm going to take a 180 from being fed or feeding other people to doing the opposite mm-hmm. uh, and fasting uh, and prayer. You have a, a new mm-hmm. ebook out in the new year. And I'd like to, you know, prayer, we know we are called to prayer. We need to prayer. Fasting is an interesting topic. If I'm not fasting, am I falling short as a Christian? Or, I mean, I know I am if I'm not praying, but prayer Praying and fasting sometimes come hand in hand. Why don't you talk about praying and fasting and, and what mm. you've experienced? Yeah, I mean, I, I never see uh, prayer or fasting or spending time in the scriptures as an issue of falling short or meeting a standard or from a position of shame. I see it as tools in my tool belt and opportunities, invitations from God to to take another step in the adventure of falling after God. So fasting is is something that we see people for thousands of years, Christians for the last 2,000 years, but even before that, people all the way back to to Moses. Um, and we see it all throughout the Bible, these men and women who spent time denying themselves food in order to understand what Jesus said, that we don't, man shall not live on bread alone, that really our spiritual hunger for God and feeding ourselves spiritually is more important than what we feed ourselves physically. And so prayer and fasting, yeah, I just released this ebook. God's really been good and using it to impact a lot of lives already uh, this year. The ebook is how to start the year in prayer and fasting. And, And years ago, probably a good eight or nine years ago, I began to start every year in prayer and fasting for, uh, the first seven days of the year. And God has just done, incredible work in my life as a result of it. Let me, if I can, just a few of the things that have happened. I mean, sometimes I come into the new year and I don't know where the year is going. I, I just carve out time to seek God and say, God, where's the year going? What should I give my energy to? Or maybe where have I gotten off track? And, and so a lot of people do new year's resolutions. Well, I don't want to just write new year human resolutions. I want to go to the God of the universe and say, God, what are your resolutions for for me, as I move into the this new year, where do I need to move my focus? Where do I need a spiritual reset? Where do I, how can I draw closer to you? And so when we talk about prayer and fasting, we're really asking God to allow our physical hunger to, to, to recalibrate us, to see our opportunity, to see our spiritual hunger met by God in prayer. And so God does so much when we do that. And Steve, it's amazing how God does breakthroughs in our life. I think sometimes when I've spent a, a week in, in prayer and fasting, there's lots of different kinds of fasts you can do. And I've done many different kinds, and it's not always the same of what I do uh, every year. But if I fast from media for a week and I turn down the noise of what I'm looking at on social media or what I'm listening to or what I'm watching, and I spend more time listening to God, it's amazing how God's voice um begins to speak to the issues of my life that I had felt unsure about. I start putting on the table, God, I need an answer to this decision in my life. And by the end of that week, I feel clarity about a decision. God begins to move on my heart and lead me. And I start writing down thoughts and I get energy around a solution or or maybe there's a relationship uh, issue that I need to ask forgiveness on and God will bring that to my memory or something that he wants me to give my energy to. And God just begins to do incredible things. When we pray and fast, we see Jesus doing that before he starts his ministry. He's praying and fasting. God gives him incredible strength as a result of, of doing that and seeking him and overcoming temptation and people repenting of sin. There's all these different kinds of things that come out of dedicating our time and energy to praying and fasting. I didn't grow up fasting and I discovered it sort of by accident. And man, am I glad that I did because God has done, he's brought about some incredible breakthroughs in my life as a result of that. How can people be blessed and get a hold of that ebook? 
anybody can go to bradjenkins.me and they can just download it for free. It'll help them to know whether they're at the beginning of the year, they want to spend a week in prayer and fasting, or really you can take the resource, you can do it at any week of the year. Uh, you can use the same method and it, it walks you through, it's a, almost a bit of a workbook to help people know how, what am I even going to pray about for seven days? How do I fast? What kind of fast can I do so that we can just equip people everywhere to seek God? couple final things, Brad. You had the unique experience. I mean, you know, it's, I don't know how often it happens. You would have more figures than I would. But when I sat under you at a church, uh, it was called The Gathering. The last time I was there, it was a middle school and an auditorium on a Sunday and pack up the church, pack it up, bring it here, take it there. You merge with another church. Walk us through that that journey of uh, merging a couple of churches and, and the, maybe the challenges and maybe other pastors are thinking uh, along mm-hmm. those lines of how to do that. What did you learn during that process in the journey? Well, it, it's an amazing story. We, we church planted in downtown Tulsa in 2006. We we're mo- a mobile church that met in schools. We packed up and set up uh, every Sunday for 10 years, which is a pretty incredible process. Felt like we were like the Israelites wandering in the <laughs> desert. And uh, we're at schools and city buildings and, and churches. We met in a lot of places. And then God brought us to this conversation with a, 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 a very well-known church here in the Tulsa area, and their pastor was about to turn 70 and about to retire. And so they reached out to me asking if I might be a, a, a successor to their pastor of 30 years. And I said, you know, I, I've, I've invested so much time with our church and so committed to what God's doing that I don't think that I would be um I don't think that I could leave the people that I've invested in to come pastor your church, but maybe if we believe that God was in this, maybe we could start something new together if we brought our churches together and started a new work. And so um, through many months of prayer, uh, conversation, talking together, we began to ask the question, if we came together, would we would God's kingdom be better if we were together? Not just that we would be together, not just two churches coming together, because that could bring with it, actually, it's possible you wouldn't even be better together. You'd be better doing the work and the places that God has called you to as individual churches. But we began to ask the question, would God's kingdom work in our region and really beyond our region all around the world? Would it, would it be better if we were together? And at the end of that process, we answered unequivocally. Yes. We believe that we would be better together that the mission of God would advance in greater ways if we were together and our churches voted unanimously to support and affirm uh, not just the merger of two churches, but actually the creation of a new work through the merger of those churches. And um, so we brought our stories of as individual churches to a final Sunday. We actually celebrated all that God had done. We came to a final Sunday, and then we started a new work the, the next Sunday together. Uh, and our church is called Anthem Church as a result of that. And seeing a beautiful, incredible process of God bringing people together that didn't know one another, but shared this desire for their for their lives and for the, the impact of their church to come together with another so that we could impact our city. And God has just done an incredible work in our region through the coming together of our churches. And God's blessed in so many ways. And and uh, it's it's amazing to look back now. Now we're six years into our story as Anthem Church and see all the people who have come to Christ as a result of that, all the all the mission work that's been birthed all around the world as a result of that. And we say only God could have done something like this through two churches that weren't even looking to merge with another church. But God brought us together because he had a plan and a purpose for us at this time in history. It's been a it's been an amazing journey and an adventure. And God has done a work that we could not have even expected as a result of it. 
What an amazing story. What I get out of that is uh, how you began that process in that it wasn't just mm-hmm. about getting bigger or it wasn't about at all about getting no. bigger. That's it wasn't even that at all. It was taking it to prayer. It's to for the glory of God, to better God's kingdom. Yeah. And, and what a what a place to start mm-hmm. uh, a must. And uh, that is great. We started with mm-hmm. the calling and and people have individual callings. And that's the name of this podcast. Uh, so I'll I'll go back to you. Did you grow up saying, oh, boy, I can't wait to be a pastor? How did God speak to you in your heart uh, that you knew that you knew that you knew that you were going to be a pastor? And that was your calling. What a fascinating question, Steve. So I was in my own journey. I had I was young. I was uh, 15 years old when I was baptized. Uh, I really wasn't passionate about the things of God. I'd been raised around the church. You know, we went on Sundays or most Sundays, but um, I have to admit, I slept through a lot of church services. I wasn't really that engaged. My faith wasn't my own. It just seemed like a set of beliefs. And at 15 years old, I decided to be baptized um, with my brother. It was uh, just a year older than me, and we got baptized together. And God did a work through my baptism that I can't even explain to this day. It's like he opened my eyes and my heart to him in a way that I did not expect. I walked into that baptism pretty passive about it. I thought, okay, this just feels like the thing I need to do. I walked out of it with a passion for my faith that I had never encountered before. And I, I bought a Bible for myself. I didn't tell anybody. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to read this thing cover to cover for myself. And for three and a half years of high school, I laid in on my bedroom floor in my room and I read the Bible for myself. Didn't tell anyone I was doing it. And during that journey, God began to speak to my heart about what I should do. And I remember being at church and I saw the pastor preaching uh, week in and week out. I thought, I think that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I sat down with my pastor and I said, can you just talk me through it? I don't have a family that was in ministry. My father is in the business world. Um, I didn't have anybody beside me. My family actually at the front wasn't sure that they thought that that's what I should do. I thought I'd be a lawyer or I'd be an architect. I'd go into some career uh, profession, but my pastor sat down with me and said, why don't we just start meeting together every few weeks for the next year? And by the end of that process, I knew that I knew in my heart as much as I could at a 16, 17 year old, that that's what. God had called me to do. And I know it's not everyone's story, but I've never wavered from it. Um, I've always believed that the way that I could bring God the most glory with my life would be to tell people about him through preaching, teaching, and leading the local church. And so for the last 20 plus years, I've been doing nothing but that preaching, teaching week in and week out, helping other people to understand the Bible for themselves and understand what it's like to follow God. I love the local church. I believe in it. I believe in the impact it can make in a city, in a community, in a, in a marriage, in the life of a teenager, a child, a person that walks in off the street. I am incredibly passionate, and I believe with all my heart that the local church connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And uh, it's been my joy to serve in the way that God has called me to all these years. So everybody's story is different. Everyone's discovery of their calling is different. But for me, it started at a a pretty young age, but it was unexpected that the work God had called me to do was to preach and teach, considering the fact, Steve, that I had slept through a lot of preaching and teaching. God has a sense of humor. (laughs) He knows what he wants to do, and he calls us sometimes into things that we would have never imagined. And that's... uh it's been an incredible journey. Well, if you ever travel to the Tulsa area, it's Anthem Church in Broken Arrow. Due to the wonderful technology that God has allowed people to do, mm-hmm. uh, go to YouTube or go, you know, Anthem Church and uh, listen and see Brad Jenkins' uh, message. And earlier, Brad, you talked about getting things you want as far as your job or your your calling, and uh, you have to mm-hmm. like it. 
And it's obvious that you have passion about what you do and you like it. You have to be good at it. And it's obvious God has equipped you and used you and you're very good at what you do. And and uh, also uh, to serve others for the glory of God the best way. And so Brad Jenkins, bullseye to you. You hit the bullseye. And we appreciate it. What you do is important. And uh, thanks for taking the time. Steve, just praying blessings on your new podcast. I know it's going to bless a lot of people and just keep going, keep doing what you're doing and helping people to follow Jesus. You've been listening to episode one of The Calling, a Family Life original podcast. Be sure to check out all of Family Life's original podcasts, including Therese Talk, If That Makes Sense, The Powerable Podcast, and Business by the Book. You can find them wherever you download content or at familylife.org. Family Life is a not-for-profit listener-supported ministry, relying on your generous support to make podcasts like this possible. Find out how you can get involved when you go to familylife.org.